Welcome to uh, the Philip Tatey Center and the Emerging Poets panel uh, created by the Academy of American Poets. Uh, uh, I wanted to thank the Academy of American Poets for arranging the event. Uh, Alex Dimitrov, Christina Laprise, and Billy Merrill, who's going to be introducing uh, our poets. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand you over to Billy Merrill, who will introduce the poets. Hi, everyone, and a uh, special thank you to, uh, obviously, the Philip Tatey Center and to uh, Adam Ludwig for taking care of us, as well as the directors, uh, Dr. Edward Nassessian and Francis Levy. Um, Mobile Libris should also be here selling books, which uh, we appreciate. Uh, please support our poets. And obviously, uh, thank you to the poets themselves for coming out uh, for this. And a, a, a personal special thank you for the All Events Pass holders. Um, I should tell you that if you need to pick up your All Events Passes and haven't already, after this, before the Ann Carson lecture, you uh, should speak to Flynn, who is right there. We're just going to go in alphabetical order, and each of the poets is going to speak briefly, and then we're um, just going to have a casual conversation. Hopefully it's enlightening, and um, there may or may not be some time at the end for questions, but um, as you have books signed and whatnot, uh, we're all going to be here to hang out afterwards. Um, the poets are Jericho Brown, whose first collection of poems is Please, uh, which was published by New Issues in 2008. He's the recipient of a Bunting Fellowship from the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University and a Whiting Writers Award. He is an assistant professor of English at the University of San Diego. Tina Chang's forthcoming collection of poems is Of Gods and Strangers, uh, which was released by Four Way Books in 2011. Her first, <laughs> will be <laughs> in 2011. Her first book, Half Lit Houses, uh, in 2004, was a finalist for an Asian American Literary Award. She's currently the Brooklyn Poet Laureate. Um, <laughs> Elena uh, Kalidiak Davis's most recent book of poems is On the Kitchen Table, from which everything has been hastily removed, uh, published by Holly Ridge Press in 2009. She is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award. She lives in Anchorage, Alaska. Megan O'Rourke's forthcoming collection of poems is Once, W.W. W. Norton, 2011. Her first book, Half Life, 2007 was a finalist for Britain's Forward First Book Prize. She is a widely published critic and has contributed to the New York Times Book Review and The New Yorker. O'Rourke lives in Brooklyn, New York. And Mark Wunderlich is the author of Voluntary Servitude, Grey Wolf Press, 2004. It says voluntary solitude in your program, but that is incorrect. Um, and The Anchorage. Uh, University of Massachusetts Press, 1999, not to be confused with the uh, uh, hometown of Elena Davis, um, which won the Lambda Literary Award. He has been the recipient of a Wallace Stegner Fellowship from Stanford University and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. Um, and we can begin. So I changed my name <laughs> years ago. And you I wanted just, to go alphabetical by your first name? Is that not, how you like, do it? Well, no, it's really <laughs> funny because my last name used to be Dimery, uh -huh. but I changed my last name to Brown, uh -huh. which, is, which is hilarious to me when things like this happen because I'm always like, why do I have to go first? But anyway, it's, like, it's like, why do I not think to change my last name to Williams like a normal person? Um, so uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here with these with these people who, uh, with these people whose poems I've loved for such a long time, and whose uh, names begin with letters. <laughs> well, that's the other honor, right? Um, and it's, but it's also, uh, it's just a, a joy to talk about this subject uh, because um, I've always believed that uh, what makes for good uh, poetry is a uh, a very a very good mixture of the ironic and the ecstatic, um, that tradition that we think of coming from, obviously, um, Dickinson and Whitman, uh, and that we are at our best when our poems are as vast and varied as the American people are. Um, uh, and I think we all believe that. Uh, hopefully somebody here will disagree with me, because then that'll be fun. 
but uh, I think for my for my own part, we were we were asked to say a little bit about influence. I I grew up in a situation where I was always turned toward a kind of how will I call it? I guess uh, ghettoized literature um, because whenever it was time to see a black play or read a black poem or read a, see a, read a black book. This all happened in the same unit or the same week. Or the same. <laughs> so, which was really fortunate because, and this happened um, the entire time I got my education. Even when I was getting my graduate degrees, uh, it would be, you know, and now it's time to read the black people. Uh, which was really wonderful for me because I read people as different as, writers as different as Gwendolyn Brooks next to uh, Yusef Komenyaka, and I examined them with the same kind of value. And I believed that I was coming to their poems, uh, that their poems were written with purpose, and I was to read them with purpose. Uh, so, uh, and that, w- that proved useful to me because uh, when I would read uh, later, you know, Zygmunt Herbert say, uh, life, is, life is beautiful, uh, when indeed he is. Uh, ironically saying something about living in a time of bombardment uh, when indeed he is saying something about something about not being able to say the way life really is uh, legally uh, prohibited to say the way life really is uh, or when I read um, when I read uh, Berryman say life friends is boring I understood that Berryman was uh, reaching into me and asking for every inch of desperation I ever knew. Life, friends, is boring. And to feel the desperation in that line, you know, which is because of the irony uh, in the dream songs. Um, but that's because I understood that there was purpose uh, to, to all of this. Um, so I wanted to share a poem that um, I thought would be of use here uh, because I was thinking you know that this that this tradition that we're talking about and that we often talk about as if there's a verses between it which I often I really wonder about because all the poets I know like poetry you know I mean all the poets I know I don't know a poet who won't read a poem I give them you know if I give them a poem they're like I'll try it you know um but I wanted to read this poem because it was one of those poems that meant so much to me when I was growing up because it seems to me, it has always seemed to me a really, uh, a really ironic poem and uh, a poem that meant the world to me when I was a very, very young child because it, it showed me how to be sneaky uh, when writing, which I loved. Um, and, and I, I thought I've been thinking. I've been thinking about this poem. I, I first I saw. I understood why I love this poem so much in 2006 when I the first time I visited this city for the 10 year anniversary of the Cave Canem retreat. Uh, I thought Michael Weaver was talking about uh, Emily Dickinson as the mother of American poetry and Walt Whitman as the father of American poetry and um, Phyllis Wheatley as that neglected mother of American poetry, which I thought was an interesting thing to say. So, um, Phyllis Wheatley, uh, 1773. On being brought from Africa to America, "'Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew, Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes, black as cane, may be refined and join the angelic train. So I I love this poem so much because I felt like, uh, you know, this, this slave woman who has no personhood whatsoever is willing to lose what little personhood she has left in the beginning of the poem and uh, by the end of the poem totally take a slap in the face of oppression and say 
uh, now that you've done this, wait till you see us in heaven, <laughs> which I think is really kind of fly for 1773. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I think, I think that's all I wanted to say, but I, I, I should end by saying this, and I, I wrote this little, um, this little note. Uh, I'm all about those multitudes. Uh, Whitman saw himself containing and quite interested in the slant truth-telling Dickinson saw as her goal. Every day I am more and more enchanted and encouraged by the way American poets of my generation show proof of these part, this part of our inheritance through writing poems that make a parent a multi-voiced speaker. Still, I do hope that this trend does not lead to a loss of responsibility for all that comes along with any one of those multi-layered identities. Uh, and that's all. Thank you all so much. Can you hear me? I have a tent. Can you hear me? Could yeah. they not hear me? No, I could definitely hear you. I just want, I'm very soft spoken. So. Um. <laughs> I'm very soft spoken. So um, thanks, Jericho. Thank you to the Academy of American Poets and uh, the rest of the poets who are here. I agree with uh, Jericho that I admire so many of these people who I'm in conversation with. So uh, it's so nice to just be a part of this. Uh, I feel like I'm not as eloquent as Jericho, so I prepared some statements because I was, I was so afraid I would forget something. Um, so uh, I'll try to make it as conversation as possible, as conversational as possible. And thinking about today's topic, sincerely ironic, I wondered what subtopic I could discuss that would speak life into this subject. And I thought, what could be more ironic or more sincere than the sight of the body? in poetry. When we think irony, we immediately imagine something in opposition to, something that works against our expectations. What we anticipate from one situation becomes, in the end, another. It involves an incongruity between what is anticipated and what actually occurs. Take, for example, and he's one of my favorite poets, James Dickey's poem, Falling. Maybe some of you are familiar with this poem. In this poem, a 29-year-old stewardess falls to her death as she is swept through an emergency door of an airplane that suddenly springs open. We, the readers, are brought through the process of her falling through the air to the ground. And in that falling, the stewardess's attitude toward her own body goes through a series of changes. As Dickey writes, and now, still thousands of feet from her death, she seems to slow. She develops interest. She turns into her maneuverable body. And as she falls, the act doesn't lead to the expected state of panic, as we would think. Instead, the stewardess embraces the atmosphere around her and embarks in an act of seduction, of all things. In letting go of fear, her body becomes a site for calm. As she, as she tempts death itself, flirts with it, as if to charm her very fate. Ultimately, it's as if in her falling, she's caught in the act of living. And Dickey says in his poem, let her now take off her hat in summer air, the contour of cornfields, and have enough time to kick off her one remaining shoe with the toes of the other foot, to, un to unhook her stockings with calm fingers, noting how fatally easy it is to undress in midair, near death when the body will assume without effort any position except the one that will sustain it, enable it to rise, live, not die, as she passes. And by poem's end, the stewardess does land on the ground. Her clothes are scattered all over Kansas, the girdle coming down fantastically on a clothesline and her blouse on a lightning rod. In James Dickey's imagination, the body never suffered. We never see the harsh confrontation with death. The stewardess seems a female counterpart to Icarus, flying in lyric, declothing, disarming, defying the future by existing completely in the present tense. Irony is also at work in Sylvia Plath's poem, the very famous poem, The Applicant, as the speaker begins with, first, are you our sort of person? Do you wear a glass eye, false teeth, or a crutch, a brace, or a hook? rubber breast or a rubber crotch. The approach to the body is that of judgment. Here the voice is fierce as it mockingly asks, will you marry it, marry it, marry it? And we can ask, what is the 
it. It is the body that is dismantled as an eye or teeth or rubber crotch. We never see the full figure as a woman or a man, but as separate parts that represent aspects of the early 1960s society. It being the marriageable body, one who is summoned to cook, sew, and talk, talk, talk. The body contains all the markings and the makings of a good housewife, and yet it must still apply for the position to be filled. It is a puppet, an applicant, a doll, with parts to be maneuvered and questioned and cajoled. The tone is sarcastic, a full commentary on the expectations of marriage and stereotypical ideals of wedded bliss. Now, looking at this poem historically, and uh, Alex of the Academy had told us, had asked us maybe to think about Shakespeare and, and Whitman. And when I look at something like Shakespeare's sonnet, Sonnet 83, listen to the sincerity of his words. There lives more life in one of your fair eyes than both your poets can in praise devise. Or Walt Whitman's description of the body and all of its sincerity in I Sing the Body Electric. The man's body is sacred and the woman's body is sacred. This is the female form, a divine nimbus exhales from it from head to foot. And later, oh, I say these are not the parts and poems of the body and parts and poems of the body only, but of the soul. These poems are in such sharp contrast to Plath's ironic twist on love and desire, which was filled with surprising rage and even scorn. And we are left wondering, what is the function of irony in contemporary poetry? What is it working for or against? And what is the source of its energy? And maybe that's something that we can all talk about later. And perhaps they're all separate questions. And I can venture to guess that irony is a modern-day tool to deal with sentiment or perhaps over-sentimentality of things heard and seen and experienced over a long period of time. So how do we deal with the age-old themes of love and death and loss and longing in Tony Hoagland's book of essays, which I love, uh, it's, a, it's a book of essays on uh, poetry and craft. It's called Real Sophistication. He speaks about narrative in relationship to the poem of the moment. And I've taken a great liberty of replacing his word narrative with the word sincerity just for the sake of argument. And if he was here, he would be absolutely appalled that I was doing that. And he would say that I was completely trashing what he was saying. But I thought... It just made for a good jumping off place for us to talk about this idea of irony and sincerity. And he says, it seems likely that sincerity in America has been tainted by its overuse in thousands of poems. Not sincerity itself, but the inadvertent sentimentality and narcissism of so many such poems have imparted an odor of indulgence. Our vision of sincerity has been narrowed by so many first-person autobiographical stories, then drowned in a flood of pathos poems. Secondly, many persons think that ours is simply not a sincere age, that contemporary experience is too multi-track, too visual, too manifold and simultaneous to be confined to the linearity of sincerity, no matter how well done. Again, these are not completely my thoughts. They're just like places, to, things to think about. And he goes on to say, systematic development and continuity are considered simplistic claustrophobic, even unimaginative. In the contemporary arena of the moment, charisma belongs to the erratic and the subversive. Irony, I believe, answers the question, how's the weather? When it is sunny outside, the sincere answer would be, the weather is beautiful. The same answer, the weather is beautiful, is ironic when it's storming outside. The thwarting of our expectations in this manner is a contemporary and most certainly a 21st century notion, one in which the poet is looking to react to the mundane, the commonplace, and definitely the familiar. Irony shakes things up and winks at the reader and makes the reader feel as if there is a disturbance, not at the surface, but beneath it. Then irony walks away having disrupted the speaker, the exchange, and the moment itself. And by challenging previous notions of speaker, exchange, and moment, new interpretations emerge. Thank you. Well, I'm confused. <laughs> and genuinely, I'm confused. And I've been reading about irony for a while. And I, I, I do believe that I employ irony in 
many ways. I think of it as a complicated rhetorical practice and as a life attitude. And I don't want, I mean, I don't know what we're doing because I don't know who the audience is. I kind of know who the poets are, but I also kind of don't. And I mean, just sitting here and a little bit panicking. Hi, Mark. Uh, <laughs> and trying to get a grip. Um, the thing is, and if I'm going to, I guess, relate it to my work as a poet, because that's the only thing I can speak from. I mean, the last time, this is a little, I want to say ironic, although it yes. technically is and is. And I, in my little journey on irony toward what end, I don't know, because it's still gathering. But I somehow, and maybe it wasn't, but somehow I got on YouTube, and this room was there, and yeah. it was a panel <laughs> yeah. on uh, the motive for metaphor. It was yeah. metaphor, right? And it was some of the people were amazing, like you know, crazy scholars, like uh, and a couple poets, and you know, poets. I don't know, like you know, this is how it's going to go. But um, <laughs> for me, that awareness of the context is essential somehow to irony, and certainly irony is sincerity. So um, can I just be a lawyer, even though I'm really not, but I kind of am? And you know, I don't know if in working on this, or I don't know who thinks about irony, but I kept losing the definition over and over. OK, I understand. I can understand when I say, and when it's pouring rain, and I say, what a great day. I, even that I can't understand. Right? <laughs> because when I say it's a great day, it means so many things. And the way I'm going to say it's a great day. So, and, and I don't want to derail everything or begin everything from a new, but it kind of seems like, you know, unless we're all just going to, whatever, if we're going to have a discussion, right? So, just gotta adjust it. it's too loud. <laughs> we're gonna this. No, we're right. just moving around a lot. Could each of you say your names as yes. you begin to speak? Because some of us don't know. Okay. Thanks. All right. My name is Elena Kalichak Davis, and here's three little things on irony. Three. Uh, it's Fowler's. Let's just go to Fowler's on irony. Can we do that, or is that retarded? No. You're, you're Megan. Okay. That, so let me just lay it out there because <laughs> when Megan, I'm. Is that okay? okay? No, I have some definitions too. So oh, this good. Will okay. Be good. Okay. I think so. so Megan, and you'll be the you'll be the champ. All right. Yeah. And and I know. I mean, I know you guys win, and I know you guys are gonna go, but feel free to. Okay. Cool. So it's not so. Okay. So. A. Well, wait, Fowler's, you know, how it does it kind of talking. It should be borne in mind, and that's so hard to do, that there are several kinds and degrees of irony, okay? The word was taken into English from Latin ironia at the beginning of the 16th century in two main senses. And it's funny because it's very ironic because I have an A, B, and a C under the two main <laughs> senses. But A, figures of speech in which the intended meaning is the opposite of that expressed by the words used, usually in the form of laudatory expressions used to imply condemnation or content. Okay, so that we can establish, like the opposite of exactly what you're saying. Everyone recognizes it, irony. And I mean, you know, it's like the first form, like my kids, the first time they said something and didn't mean it, I'm thrilled. It's a sign of intelligent life <laughs> in the human being. Okay. But then, but I mean, you know, that's too simple and we don't want to talk about that, right? Although maybe we do. But B, okay, so in its etymological and ultimately Greek sense, whatever, dissimulation, which is a great word, pretense, especially with reference to the dissimulation of ignorance practiced by Socrates as a means of confuting an adversary. And when I start thinking about that one, also called Socratic irony, and when I think about that one, I mean, Immediately for me, it goes to inhabiting a state of unknowing and an admission. I mean, I don't know what I'm saying, but I also know that you don't know what you're saying. So in, for me, um, that's a big deal. And then the third, I mean, I don't know, and that didn't sound exactly right, but we'll see what happens. And the third is dramatic irony, where the audience or the reader knows more about the outcome of a play, play or epic poem than the characters do. And I also feel that applies, because I think um, a lot of the time, the reader is going to know more than I know, too. I mean, I like the state of unknowing and and 
context. But, okay, so to me, it's a detachment and awareness of context, but it's also a bigger involvement. So, yes, I believe in sincerity, but, like, say from my life, like my last little sexual romantic relationship failed because I can't believe somebody when they just say the thing. I need it to be modified in a million different ways and all those admissions to be made. And as a poet, I think that's what I do, and I do it as a person, and that's what I'm trying to do now. But I know it's kind of working and not. And for me, the most interesting thing about this is illusion. When we use, you know, lines from other poems or ideas from other poems and how are we using it. And I have a bunch of millions of interesting quotes and stuff, but I'm going to stop just to let you guys go and then maybe I can, you know, add more later. Is that all right? Perfect. Yes. Great. Um, I'm really glad, Alina, that you sort of brought us back to irony and sincerity as, ter- as terms or brought us to them. Um, I had... I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Ironic that we would just be asked this. I know. <laughs> Megan O'Rourke. Um, and on, on the other sort of level of large-scale irony, I was thinking that this is probably the panel I've prepared the most for and have the least concrete thing to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was wondering if everyone felt a version yes. of that. This is a very like <laughs> difficult, slippery topic as soon as you start to... Uh, say anything. It feels like you could say it another way or think of another moment. Um, but yes, like Elena, I went to the dictionaries and the etymological sources um, and found what you found about about irony. Um, so this is, you know, idea of the situational irony that the characters might know something, not know something that the reader knows, or vice versa, right? And then kind of a tonal irony when we are saying something that. Um, were sort of purported to be the opposite of what we actually mean. And this other one, which is really interesting, which is feigning ignorance, right? Um, I also was look, looking at sincerity because I was found that as I was trying to think about this topic that I kept coming back to the feeling that sincerity seems like a dirty word in poetry and in literature today, and why might that be, right? So I wonder, wondering if we could look at that and think about that. And I I think it goes back to this idea that that irony is necessarily double in some way. It's dissembling. Actually, the Greek word it comes from originally just meant to say, which is in of itself fascinating, that to say was the word that became to dissemble or to to be doubled. Sincerity, on the other hand, comes from the Latin and um, meant sound, whole, pure, genuine, or um, one speculation of its origin was that it was, quote, of a single growth. So something that was not hybrid, but of a single growth. So, So that seemed a useful beginning point. And one thing I noticed as I was looking at usages of sincerity in poetry over time and, and in other kinds of documents was that it used to be taken to be much more synonymous with truth. So that you would say of somebody, that was a sincere and true statement, or God's doctrine was is sincere and true, right? And at some point, it seems to me that we have slipped from the sense that sincerity means truth toward a sense that sincerity means the effort to tell truth, the belief that one is telling truth, which many of us are skeptical about, right, it seems. Or perhaps more of us are skeptical about that effort to tell the truth now than at any other time. You know, when you look at American poetry, and you start with Whitman and Dickinson, I mean, obviously, sort of the forefathers, foremothers, both are both poets who make use of what we might call sincerity and irony, I think, in very, very different ways. But it does seem that there's been this kind of struggle between what might seem like the poles of sincerity and irony, you know, going on and on over over time, and that right now we're in a particularly intensive moment of that. And I wondered if anyone agreed with that, but that was something I was wondering about. But what I want to just kind of think about or have us think about a little bit is you know, is sincerity a, a kind of a something we don't want in our poems? Is it is it that we actually want something like truth, right? This is what Louise Glick argued in an essay called Against Sincerity that's in her book, Proofs and Theorems. She said, sincerity in of itself is not really a goal, right? We can all be um, sincere and be wrong. 
So, for example, um, I can't even think of a good example of a sincere statement that's wrong. Um, I can think I of a lot. I love you. I love you. <laughs> That did come to mind. Totally, right? You can say, I love you, and it can be sincere in the moment and wrong. And this is, I think, part of why we particularly are worried about sincerity and why you might crave irony in those different levels right now, which is to say that more than ever, I think as poets, particularly as people practicing poetry, we're thinking about the idea that ourselves are not stable, right? Or, or as Emerson would have put it in a slightly different way, that our moods do not resemble one another, right? And, and uh, once you've said, I love you, to somebody that you stop loving, you start to doubt that statement, the value of that statement. Um, so it seems that then we start to, we, we've started to kind of associate sincerity with a kind of, possibly with a trite idealism, with a, with a kind of too easy optimism, with conviction, right? Whereas we associate irony with alienation, pessimism, discontent, maybe evasiveness, right? And that irony, you know, certainly in the 90s when I was growing up, ha having been a kid in the 80s when it seemed like Duran Duran and every hair band took themselves quite sincerely, and that was the mode in which I received the world, then suddenly Suddenly, you got to the 1990s and irony and bands like Pavement, where you couldn't detect the, which I loved, right? Which you couldn't, where you couldn't detect what was actually being said, but the mode of saying was itself extremely attractive, right? This kind of cool coyness um, seemed seemed really attractive. And now we're coming back out of that, it seems to me. We're sort of swinging, maybe, I don't know where we're swinging to or if we are swinging, and I'm curious what others, what others think. But... I wanted to ask whether it is possible to have a sincerity that is not sentimental or sloppy, right? Um, it seems to me that the problem with both these terms is they can be really capacious, and I wanted to start to come up with definitions of the things that I like in irony and the things that I like in sincerity, right? If we can have cheap ironies, we can also have cheap sincerities, which I started to think of as the egotistical sincere, you know, the moment when your conviction um, is what's the octane of your statement, but it hasn't been interrogated fully yet. Um, I should stop. I have a lot more. This like we could just go on, and I'm there's so much to say. But I wanted to I wanted to just do one little thing before we turn to Mark, which is I wanted to read two uh, two stanzas from an early draft of a poem that became Ari um, Sylvia Plath's Ariel, because. In Louise Glick's essay, Against Sincerity, she talks about the artist's task involving transformation of the actual to the true. And she says that sincerity basically is transcription, and honesty or truth-telling is transformation. And that seemed like something useful as a kind of hook to think about with writing. Um, this poem is called Whiteness I Remember. It was written on, in 1958. And it's a precursor poem to Ariel in which Plath is trying to tell the same story, in a sense. There's the same generative event at the, at the heart of the poem. But it's much more transcribing the event, I think, in what we might call a sincere way. And the poem begins, Whiteness being what I remember about Sam. Whiteness and the great run he gave me. I've gone nowhere since but going's been tame deviation. White, not of heraldic stallions. Off-white, of the stable horse, whose history's humdrum unexceptionable, his tired sobriety hiring him out to novices and to the timid. Yet the dapple toning his white down to safe gray never grayed his temper. I'm going to skip a stanza. And then the end, she's basically been thrown from this, this rather tame-seeming horse. And she says, stirrups undone and decorum, and wouldn't slow for the hauled reins, his name, or shouts of walkers, crossroad traffic, stalling curbside at his oncoming, the world subdued to his run of it, I hung on his neck. Resoluteness simplified me, a rider riding hung out over hazard, over hooves loud on earth's bedrock, almost thrown, not thrown, fear, wisdom at one, all colors spinning to still in his one whiteness. And just to give you a sense of what the poem began, became, I'll read a couple stanzas from Ariel. And if you look at the two side by side, which I recommend, you'll find that the only word, phrase that's the same phrase in each poem is the phrase at one, which you just heard. So Ariel begins, stasis in darkness. Then the substanceless blue pour of tor and distances. God's lioness, how one we grow. 
pivot of heels and knees. The furrow splits and passes. I'm just going to read the very end now. And now I foam to wheat a glitter of seas. The child's cry melts in the wall. And I am the arrow, the dew that flies suicidal, at one with the drive into the red eye, the cauldron of mourning. So, thanks. Whiteness I remember. And it's in the collected plath. I'm Mark Wunderlich. And um, it, as I thought about this, this subject, like my, my fellow panelists here, um, I, 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 the more I thought about it, the less of a grip I felt I had on it, as has been said before. It's a very slippery subject in a lot of ways. And um, I, I believe that I started to think of sincerity and truth as having a kind of relationship with each other. That sincerity is a sort of desire to state the truth in some fashion. Um, as, as Megan has pointed out, that can often be wrong, right? Uh, but but it's, um, this became part of the sort of center of my thinking about this. I started taking notes on this subject, and basically I came up with a, a series of individual statements that at the time of writing them down, I believed. Um, <laughs> now I'm not so sure as I've, I re reread them and look at them again. But I'm, I'm going to just sort of read them and hope that they're maybe provocative. One way of thinking about these two terms might be to see this as a conversation about the effects of romanticism versus the effects of modernism, of feeling versus thinking. And I think that when, when we think of sincerity, we can, uh, you know, we often think of, of the romantic poets. I think of Shelley saying, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. This is not an ironic statement. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think is, is hardest for us to, um, to take now in reading the Romantic poets is their ultimate sincerity, is their, their lack of irony in so many of their poems. But that's because it's so focused on the individual. It's so focused on the idea of individual experience, of interiority, of there being some kind of uh, that, that aesthetic experience, that experiences with beauty can lead one toward, um, uh, toward a spiritual enlightenment or truth. Mm. Therefore, irony is seldom employed mm. with the romantics. And I th when I think of modernism, with I th when I think of the acceleration of technology with the world at war, um, it becomes a lot harder to make a statement like, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. The world has become a more grim and complicated place. The world seems larger. Individual experience is being dwarfed by the city, by uh, the war, by large governments, by forces that are beyond individual control. And therefore, one begins to employ irony as a tactic to ward off the world. Um, Irony will always be subservient to sincerity. Irony is a shield used to protect the vulnerable self. It's interesting to me that a number of people have, have talked about Sylvia Plath. I, too, thought about her. When Ted Hughes reordered Sylvia Plath's original version of her book, Ariel, he took from her an ironic distance that she had carefully created with the intention of tearing it down. The two versions of that book, as you know, the, the uh, version that she put together and the version that he put together after her death, when read all the way through, tell two quite different stories. Um, and, uh, and I believe that her intention, when I read her original version of the book, was to create a persona and a self that was ironic, that was often ugly, that was self-loathing, um, that uh, did a number of things that were, are, are quite despicable in many ways, that, that represent the sort of ugliness of the self. And toward the end of that book, she took a number of, of uh, rhetorical moves to break that self down 
And she ended up with something much more sincere at the end of that poem, something at the end of that book, something much more true. When Hughes reordered that book, what he created was a sense of, um, he, he started taking us away from the sense of, of the ironic self as a created persona. And he began crafting it as a book in which the utterance of the poet was true, right? Was represented where, where there was not a mediated relationship between feeling and poem, um, which she certainly had. And I think that that, that makes his version of the book is, is, is a less successful and less interesting, less complicated, less sophisticated version than her original one. Poems do not express emotions and feelings. They manipulate them. If you want to express a feeling, there are many more direct ways of doing this than rendering them in verse. <laughs> Sincerity should not be confused or conflated with sentimentality, even though they are first cousins. Likewise, sincerity should not be conflated with the truth. Irony should not be confused with worldliness or sophistication. All good poems are sincere, even though they may employ irony. Irony is a minor planet orbiting around that which is sincere. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes sincerity is best expressed through the veil of irony. Irony is a tone. Sincerity is a fact. And finally, all good music is sad music. <laughs> Yeah, I wish we would have interrupted you more in between them. But, I mean, we do have to point out the fact, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. He's writing a poem. I mean, you know, right? There is one step of remove. And he's not really just saying that, right? So we're not saying the opposite. Word. We're not just saying that. And that really made me think about this. And, and the thinking, feeling thing, I mean, I was talking with my friend Joe, and I mean, that's a very important thing. But, like, this is a weird thing that seems so relevant, but wasn't. It was Helen Vendler talking about the last looks, the last mm -hmm. looks book with Plath and whatever. And this was on Meryl, but it didn't really me mean anything. And I think we could maybe talk about this as poets. Like, when do, do we make a conscious turn to irony? Do But she says... We must remember that for poets, metaphors are not figures of speech or rhetorical adornments. They are the precise and literal truth of feeling voiced as closely as the poet can approximate it. And so to me, that's a bunch of bullshit. I mean, you know, you're still thinking I fall upon the thorns of life. I believe that sounds pretty good. I mean, you know, but I want to believe in some. And I, I mean, I don't know. I never had a problem with sincerity. I just found that you have to do so much to get there. Like, I didn't know where the stop point of was of proclaiming anything because there would always be, you know, something else to make it more true or more sincere. So I don't know. But so that whole, I mean, I don't know. Let's say, and I'm sure we have a wide range. Sometimes you decide to write a poem that is pretty heavily ironic, right? I mean, and it, to me, it's a playfulness as well. And then, um, OK. Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on what both of you are saying, I, um, one thing that struck me when you read the, the Shelley lines is also it's metrical, mm -hmm. um, which I wonder how much the kind of move toward free verse and move toward away from metrical, regular metrical patterns um, kind of necessitated more irony. You know, is, is it possible that that helped necessitate more irony? But um, I wonder if, if irony, I think you said irony is a tone and sincerity is a fact. Yes. Okay. So yeah, I th was thinking a lot about this, and I was thinking that maybe there. I had come to the conclusion, very similar in broad scale to yours, but I had come to the conclusion that both were tones trying to arrive at truth, what we might call truth, mm -hmm. right? And now, one working in either tone or both tones might then further, you know, and here's where we get all the Venn diagrams, decide that there is no such thing as truth, right? And that's a whole component of this. Um, but you know the the problem with sincerity to me as a mode the, the risk it runs is that i can be utterly sincere and not write a good poem right so the so the measuring of my sincerity as a criteria or a fact in my poem 
is neither here nor there, right? And that's the, case. the same thing so with irony. Yeah. Same thing with irony, right? Well, the same and is thing that based irony. on that a poem should be doing more than one thing? I mean, um, yes. I mean, is that what we're saying? We want a complexity, and we equate. I mean, or sincerity is more apt to fall into a place of. On complexity. I, I think both well, I just have think it's risks. impossible yeah. to write a sin. I mean, I'm sorry, but I just, I think a line break. I, I've always thought line breaks meant doubt. Mm-hmm. I mean, what? I mean, what, <laughs> what happens? Else? Right? What happens when you get to a line? I mean, a line break is telling you, you don't know what's coming next, right? That's good. And you're, like that. you know, like that's what that's what it is, and so I just I've never. And th- I guess this is part of what I was trying to say. Like, I've never had an understanding that you could write a sincere... I just, I mean, maybe maybe this has to do with being born when I was born or something. But I just never I think felt like you could write a, 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 a sincere poem or... Yeah, I mean, think yeah. irony is just as risky to write a shitty poem as totally. sincerity is. Totally, but it's a more yeah. guarded. I think I was trying to identify what are the different risks of each, and it seemed like the well, sincerity, the risk, the risk is self exposure or corniness, or what else could we add to that? I well, think there, we there are other. About sentimentality. Sentimentality. Before, but what was your statement before? It was, um, say it again. Which one? The, you made all these great statements about sincerity is not sentimentality. Yeah. Is that what you said? And then, mm-hmm. since, and then you made a statement before that, that about sincerity and yeah. truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? uh, sincerity should not be confused or conflated with sentimentality. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I think that I, I find this a lot with... Um, Students I work with now, where there, there seems to be a, 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 a tremendous resistance um, to a sincere expression that is not mediated by some kind of ironic distance, you know, and and I think that there is because the, for fear that it is going to be branded sentimental, you know, that it's going to be sort of painted with that with that brush, and there is this this sense now of sentimentality as being the kind of the, the greater sin. You know, and and um, and I, I inevitably come down to this something that I think is really true. You have to risk sentimentality in a poem. You have to risk crossing over that line if everything is is kind of ironically coded um, in, in the poem. You it, it ends up being it can be kind of dead on arrival. You know, yeah, and uh, and so on the other hand, I, I think that right now we're in this sort of in a period of time in American poetry where we're we're increasingly resistant to these the, the poem as sort of representation of the lived life of you know using kind of first person. Um, a, a first-person narrator in a poem that is that is relating experience. Um, it, it, it's remember when when everyone was writing a memoir, when everyone was writing a, a, a memoir, and the more salacious, the better. You know, there were memoirs about about being eaten alive by a by a hyena, and memoirs about affairs with relatives, and you know these this sort of trajectory that we were taking in, in that toward this kind of ultimate confession, and then that all has kind of collapsed, you know. And thank goodness, in some way, it was it was sort of too much. Uh, we also see it saw it kind of debated in, in ideas about nonfiction and nonfiction's ability to represent life experience. And we saw that played out on Oprah, you know. So, so I, I think that, that um, that's part of this conversation as well. I think we're resistant to, to the sincere now because it, it so often crosses over into um, the sort of, I hate to use the word confessional because it's inaccurate, but in, into what we might perceive as confessional. And I think you're right. I think it oftentimes is equated. And one of the things that, besides struggling with, it might not have seemed like that, besides struggling with the definitions, which I was, because every time, the only way that I could even remind myself of irony and sincerity is by going back to the poems themselves. And then I had this sort of larger question uh, that kept coming into my imagination as I was writing this. I kept thinking, in our uh, in the present day, do I recognize and is there a poetry that exists that embodies both 
sincerity and irony at the same time. I kind of wanted to put it out there, and I kept coming back to this poem. And I don't know. Somebody should yell out the, the title of the poem. I've heard Brenda Shaughnessy re read this poem so many times. And um, it was a great example of where sincerity and irony existed at once. It was where the speaker writes in the snow the word snow. And she's doing it very sincerely at the moment. But then she says something. to Then she recognizes what she's doing to be so sincere, which might then cross over to a sentimentality, and then she says something to the effect like, I'm so sick of myself. <laughs> so I felt like that was a really great example in sort of uh, our contemporary poetry of a, of a young, they call us emerging poets, that um, is embodying something like this. But I think something else that we should consider, which I think both Megan and Mark started to talk about, is that why irony now? And I felt like the both of you started to address it, and you started to talk about war. I mean, how can we, in a sort of post-9-11 um, environment, n not employ irony um, in work? Because it's almost like um, a sense of tearing down. I think you started to talk about the sense of a scaffolding. Was it, was it you that started to talk about the scaffolding? Or maybe it was in my imagination that you were. It's like the scaffolding of sincerity is there. And then maybe post 9-11 or this age that we're living in is a sort of tearing down of that scaffolding. And maybe irony is a part of that. But I felt like what the both of you were saying about this time, this past decade, really feeds into why this sort of ironic voice or the ironic tone That's is coming into play. so fascinating because after 9-11, there was a whole plethora of articles about how now irony would be dead. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in fact, we were going to all want to go around telling the truth all the time. And I was thinking <laughs> that that's akin to saying when you, when you are living with someone who's dying, for example, that, okay, now every moment is going to be the exalted romantic moment because they're dying and we know they're dying. And of course, as you discover, it's not like that, right, at all. And, and so I think, of course, irony um, came back in. I mean, I do think there are cultural reasons for the fact that, as you were saying, Mark, students f seem to find it a greater sin to commit sentimentality than to commit obfuscation, we might say, right? Um, I feel that way too often about, about my work. Um, I think that has to do with being surrounded by, you know, Hollywood advertising. Mean, I'm not saying anything surprising or new, but I think we have to kind of admit that that, or just put that on the table, right? We're surrounded by so much language that is um, insincerely sincere or sincerely insincere. I don't know mm -hmm. which. Mm -hmm. And um, just I was looking back at old ads, you know, I, that turned out to be ironic, and one of them was from um, an ad about the Twin Towers and asbestos, and it said. It was an image of the Twin Towers from 1981, and it said, it took two hours to evacuate these buildings during a fire. Um, and then it said, asbestos, it's something like, asbestos is the thing that saves you, or, you know, it was, <laughs> I can't remember exa the exact thing. And of course, when it, the towers fell, the asbestos didn't save anyone from being in the towers falling, and it also became the thing that poisoned many people, right, or, you know, made people sick. So I bring that up because I think that living in a culture where you're constantly being surrounded by that kind of encounter with language that design, has designs on you does make it difficult to um, locate a space for sincerity, and yet it seems necessary to do so to, to me. Um, I, I want to add, though, that I think... Um I don't know if this is students or people who are not students or you know, poets in general, but uh, this, this, this point you, you and Mark both made about uh, obfuscation seems to me, uh, I think part, part of the problem there has to do, and, and I, I, was, I was talking about this earlier when I was talking about purpose, right? Um, I think often people want to write poems and it seems to me that at some point in the revision of the poem, um, and I always think of putting a book together as part of the revision process, uh, but at some point in the, in the revision of the poem, there would be an end. Like there would be a, mm. that the poem does bring me somewhere I was not before. And even if that place is, there is no truth. Um, then it brings me to this place 
in a bigger way than, than where, I, where I was before, right? That, that, that there is purpose, you know. Um, that purpose might be beauty, that purpose might be thought, that pur- whatever that purpose is. Uh, but I find that, I mean, you were asking about what the, we, we seem to know what the risks of, um, what the risk, uh, risks of sincerity are, but I think sometimes the risks of irony have to do with really writing about nothing, um, writing and having nothing to say, writing because it's time to put a book out <laughs> as opposed to writing because uh, I got a poem in me and it won't stop, which seems to me uh, to be, uh, I mean, that feeling of I got a poem in me and it won't stop seems to me to be something that can happen, whether your, po- whether your poem is ironic or since whether it uses the tools of irony or sincerity. So I just, I think that for me has always been, I mean, that, that's what drives me crazy when I pick up a literary journal and I'm reading a so-called ironic poem and I get through it and I don't care and I haven't been brought anywhere. And I, I mean, it's interesting that Elena said, I mean, Elena said this about her own poems. You do, like you use irony heavily in your poems. But when you put a book together, I feel like there's some, that something's gone on, you know. I mean, we could. I mean, when, when whether it's whether I mean whether you're talking about the rabbit catcher or Ariel, something goes on when that book is put together. You know, um, I just keep thinking about tulips too. I just I mean like. You know, my, my, my children smile, out, smile at me out of the family photo. Their smiles, little smiling hooks. You know, it's like, I don't know. So that's, I just, I would like an I would like for there to be reasons things happen. My name is Jericho Brown. I keep, <laughs> I keep feeling like I should say my name every five minutes. I'm sorry. Like the reason being some sense of necessity. Yeah, like they're, like... Like, I feel like people, I mean, and I feel like I see this in the way we give our readings, in the way we submit our poems to journals, in the way we move in the world, in the way we talk about poetry. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, we, like, until we have some sort of belief in this thing, then, of course not. Like, of mm-hmm. course there are going to be all these poems that aren't saying very much, but are really cute. Mm-hmm. which I think you are trying to point to, Mark, like a lot of cutesiness going on, right? Yeah, I think, I think that, um, you know, when I read a poem, I, I, I want to have the, the sense that it was, um, it was necessary. Yeah. You know, that, it's, that it was necessary for the poet to write it. Uh, it that... As soon as these words come out of my mouth, I think that this is, again, I, I'm... I'm, I'm I, I, you know, it's the it's the specter of romanticism. It's still there, you know, and and I think um, I, I think that that we're still very influenced by those same same notions. You know, we're talking about truth, and we're talking about necessity, and and um, and and feeling somehow, um, and and we can't ever quite escape escape these terms. Yeah. And when you're and when you're talking about risk, going back to that idea of risk, you know the risk of the risk of sincerity is possibly uh, sentimentality. The risk, I think, also of ironies is the possibility of of cleverness. And um, I think being clever could possibly be. We we're talking about this idea of the dirty word. Why is sincerity dirty word? And I think that the idea of being clever also um, could have the possibility of being a dirty word because mm-hmm. cleverness could indicate um, something that's fleeting. It's sort of like what you said, when you finish something, uh, does, does, the, the, does the, the, the ghost of it, does the, does you know, is there a palimpsest? Is there something that remains with you yeah. that makes you uh, remember the poem? And I think that those are sometimes, I can't say across the board because we're not really talking about specific poems here. We're talking about poetry. Uh, I think that's, that's the risk there for, for irony. But I think a lot of us keep talking about Sylvia Plath because there is um, a, 
an element to her work where I think that she was she was able to do both. And maybe Elena, I don't know, I don't know when you were saying like once Elena finishes her book, maybe uh, without knowing there are tremendous aspects of both and that push and pull of the sincerity and the irony. As with Sylvia Plath's book, Ariel is what makes it memorable because so many of us have been talking about the ir- ironic aspects of her work but there's also the opposite side of her work which is completely sincere especially when you're talking about the arrangement of her book it was so important to how we read her uh, or read the speaker on the page should we open things up yet um, could, it's a, it's a, yeah I mean we have uh, people were roughly, I saw people raising yeah. hands so we have like 25 minutes so uh, if anyone would like to ask a question I just ask that you come up to these mics maybe we could make a little line and go back and forth at each hi my name is Victoria Dill hi and hi <laughs> Um, I just wanted to put another word out there, which I think is interesting. Um, I find myself thinking about the word clarity. And I think to myself as a poet that I write to be clear. And that perhaps, as Mark suggested, the tonality in which you do that could be sincerity or it could be ironic. And as Elena suggested, that you use metaphors to focus your lens into being clear. And I was just wondering if you could comment on the word clarity in this discussion. Um, Is it okay? It's interesting that you bring that up because one of my students in, in my undergraduate class, I'm, I'm Tina Chang, by the way. I'm probably the last person to really introduce myself. Um, yesterday we had a, a class, and one of my students said to me, you know, Tina, I have to say I'm very confused because on the one hand, I think that you want us to be clear. And on the other hand, you want us to maintain a sense of mystery in our work. And then we had to get down to other, uh, I think that some of the confusion was we were talking about the differences between being ambiguous in your poems and being very vague in your poems. So I think it's actually very difficult because some of us as poets work toward that immense sense of clarity. We all want, I think, in the end to be understood. I would hope that when we all make poems, when we all shape poems, and then ultimately when we put poems out in the world, I don't think that anybody thinks to themselves, I don't want to be understood at all. Even if their language is sort of um, uh, skewed and disassociative and it leaps all over the place in terms of uh, different connections, I think they ultimately want to be understood. That's at least my sense of, of the word clarity in the end. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. I'm, I'd like to throw into the ring uh, Marianne Moore's statement that she made, um, which kind of everyone's been talking about uh, sincerity and about kind of like the utterance of, and hers is more about this, so originality is a byproduct of sincerity, that is to say a feeling that is honest and accordingly rejects anything that would cloud the impression, such as unnecessary commas, modifying clauses (laughs) or delayed predicates so I think it might be useful to open it up to sincerity being uh, I don't know who said this, but it was, it was, unless one is very talented, indeed, there's no resting place between the naive and ironic. And I, I mean, I think we're talking about, you know, that difficulty. And when I think about clarity, I think about ambiguity. And, you know, in some ways, irony, you know, it made me want to try to understand Emson's seven types of ambiguity, because it seemed like it's the same thing. I mean, we are talking about layers. And so... I don't know. That's why. And to me, the layers are part of what is the thing I go to poetry for, right? I mean, um, I keep thinking about the Berryman <laughs> line that you quoted, Jericho, life, life for my boring. friends is boring, which is a brilliant, beautiful, and extraordinary line precisely because it stages two things at once in that poem. It says, life is boring, life is dull, it's the anti-romantic. It also says, life is boring. It bores into you and pierces you, right? It does those things in one, right? And it's self-contradictory. It's holding in mind um, the but contradictoriness of experience. By, but we're not supposed to say so, so which is right. the thing. And I think, I mean, I think right. the whole argument has been pushed further beyond yeah. that. Yeah, there is a self-reflexivity, and that right. can be 
annoying as hell too and not get anywhere. Right. And I don't, I mean, I think that originally irony or whatever, it was a tool of exposing hypocrisy. And now we, ha we don't really have something that we are opposed yes. to. There are too many, yes. you know, I mean, we've gone to too many, to too many, to too many. So, I mean, we're not, I mean, I think it's, you know, exponentially yeah. more complicated. And yet, I mean, I, I do think, though, that we would all say we are trying to be s sincere. We are going for truth. We are going for beauty. I mean, you know, no matter how ironic, I mean, you do what you have to do. You do anything you have to do. Right. And, and, and it, but in order to do that, like, like this thing that you're saying about ex exposing hypocrisy, for instance, and how, like, extrapolated into, I mean, all of this has, has something to do with this idea that, that poems are only for like poems. Like, you know, um, <laughs> like in uh, Tradition of Individual Talent, El Eliot said every time you write a poem, you change all the poems before it. Yeah. Right? And so people thought that that meant, oh, every time I write a poem, the only thing I'm doing is writing poems. And, <laughs> as if, like, as if nothing else can be affected by, as if like, you know, I, the truth is, yeah, I change all the poems, but I also change my hair and I change Matisse and I change uh, getting on the subway. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which is what I really think about poetry. That would be cool if poetry really well, changed it's that. my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's also starting from scratch. Yeah. It's, you know, again and again, despite all, everything you're using, all the illusions you're making, you really want to start from scratch. Yeah. And, and you know, I think I think one thing we're always doing is is grappling with this the, the problem of language's ability to represent experience, language's ability to represent the self. And you know, a number of people also sp spoke about Whitman and Dickinson. And the thing that they do in all of their in in so many of their poems, or in Leaves of Grass, but also in, of course in Dickinson's individual poems, is they reinvent these personas over and over again. They reshape them. They retool them. Dickinson speaks through, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's polyphonic. I mean, she speaks through so many different personas in those poems, and Whitman creates one persona that he's constantly changing and modulating and shaping as you go through that whole long book because they don't, they don't believe that, that they can represent one single thing with one personhood, with one persona. So they invent multitudes, right? But I mean, I wanted to say something about your question about um, about clarity. Uh, in my, I, you know, I teach a three-hour workshop, which I actually I ask the students if you take the workshop, you have to stay for four hours instead of three hours because we workshop line by line and we workshop sentences in every poem, so it takes a long time and gets on my nerves. But um, I, though I love it, obviously it's my choice, right? Um, so I, but. I think for me, clarity always, I, every time I think about clarity, I only think about it on the sentence level. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that, I don't mean, I don't know what that's about, but I never expect clarity in a poem. I just expect clarity sentence by sentence in a poem. Like as I'm re whenever I read a poem, I don't, and maybe that's just the way I read only, but I never read, I mean, if that, if that was a, were the case, I would have never liked Plath. Right, because I was, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I found Plath when I was 16 years old, and I was really attracted to how much I thought she was, I mean, and I wouldn't say unclear was the word now, but at the time I was like, it was, I just was confused, <laughs> you know. But sentence by sentence, everything made sense. Well, when you start to step back, you raise the question of clarity to whom and for whom. And you could draw boundaries around that that would exclude a lot of kinds of poems from getting made, I think, that, that I wouldn't want to do. I'm thinking of, like, for example, you know, um, you could look side by side at um, Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn and Brenda Hillman's Styrofoam Cup. And if you hadn't read Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn, the kind of work that was being done in Hillman's Styrofoam Cup would not, I think, be very clear, mm -hmm. right? But the poem itself is actually clear mm -hmm. and, and to the degree that we want it to be, I mean, that it, that it wants to be, and, and I, don't, I wouldn't ask anything different of that, mm -hmm. of that poem. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to think about the texture right within versus the yeah. context. You're right about that. Is there another question? Yeah. Um, first, I just want to say I, I love everything that everyone said, even if when they, it sounds like you're disagreeing with each other. <laughs> but um, I was trying to put the concepts together in a framework, and I had to sort of reach outside of poetry uh, to find a metaphor. And when I thought of sincerity I, and irony, I compared Fox News and 
Comedy Central and the way they handle <laughs> politics. And I think of, and I'm assuming that this is not too much of a Tea Party gathering, but I, I see Fox News as um, pretty sincere. <laughs> but um, here's my framework, and I realize it's artificial, but I wanted to bounce it off of you if you thought it was interesting. That, um, as Mark, I think, was saying, I forget your last name. I'm not trying to be rude. Wonder, but uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is that we, we kind of are inescapably sincere. We really believe something. And maybe truth is the destiny, but maybe irony is the corrective to that sincerity. So I wanted to throw that out there and th- see what you think. Because I think maybe Comedy Central uses a lot of irony, but it's as a corrective to, make, to check our sincerity. It, towards the goal of truth. Yeah. So. To check false sincerity in particular, too, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know. hypocrisy. Yeah. Well, it's cynical. You know, I think of Fox News as being really cynical. Yeah. Um, I, I, think of, I think of, you know, The Daily Show as being, um, as being this sort of, up, sort of playful irony. But there's a, there's, a, you know, there's a danger to that as well. It, it, it's that you can't... One thing that bothers me about something like the the Daily Show is this sense that nothing can be taken that seriously. You know that that everything needs to be kind of ironized. That everything needs we, we that that we live in this era where we're we we're very skeptical of approaching anything with sincere feeling, with with or actual feeling. And what the Daily Show does, I think, is it even though it's very funny, I watch it, I love it, you know, but it's it's constantly buffering and and pushing against um, this other pole which is which is cynicism, which is how I think, you know, Fox News is kind of produced. And and the the two one is not an antidote to the other, you know. It's that that they're both they're both creating these two poles, and there's this kind of crazy electricity between the two of them, and it's all static. You know, nothing can kind of be said in between the two. Is it is it O'Reilly the Fox News person? Bill O'Reilly is that his name? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's funny because I never think of that as. I mean, maybe I don't know what cynicism is or something. I, I guess I always think of that as him being kind of. I think he's really sincere and that he sees himself or is at least trying to project himself as a kind of crusader um, and that many and that many people in the United States kind of jump on this, the bandwagon of the of the crusade mm-hmm. um, I mean I, I mean I say that I say that to say that I think a thinking person uh, I think a thinking person would want to buffer that because one has to live on a. This, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, particularly in the United States, and this is what I. I mean, this is what I really think about American poetry. Like, if you think about like everything being a microcosm of the bigger thing, right? Like, um, and I'm glad you brought. Uh, I'm glad you brought September 11th up because you know this is the thing people used to get in trouble for saying. Like, like you know, sooner or later, and this and this happens around race a lot too, particularly since our um, since our last president was elected. That something happened and people started realizing, I've done something wrong, <laughs> and I am participating in a system that does something wrong every day, and I'm a part of something wrong. I should probably make it stop. But if I make it stop, I lose everything. So since I don't want to lose everything, I'm going to laugh. <laughs> and I think that's what that buffer, I'm not saying the buffer's right, but I think that's why that buffer exists. Because in, in actuality, if we were to face all the ways that we were evil, all the ways that we participate <laughs> in our nation's evil, then we would have to like, I mean, we would be facing some really scary stuff and we would all slit our wrists. But who wants to slit their wrists? (laughs) (laughs) But I I think that the things that that the both of you are saying, it's also still an an argument in terms of, in 
terms of talking about poetry as well, because what, what I'm thinking about when you're talking about, when we're talking about the same show, Fox News, and you're talking about cynicism, and you're talking about sincerity, and I could say, well, when he's speaking on Fox News, I truly believe that he thinks that he's speaking from a sincere place, mm -hmm. that he's speaking from a place of truth. And I think that when we're getting back to poetry, because I think that you were trying to use it in, yeah. in, in a way to be able to talk about poetry, it's the same thing. I think it's about intention, what the person um, O'Reilly intended, and then what's received on the other side, which might be cynicism. And I think it's a very similar sort of argument when it comes to poetry, is what we intend as we're writing the poem received on the other side as, as such. I mean, it's probably a little bit different than what you're getting at, but I just, I just thought this idea of a writer and audience also comes into play in the sort of, in sort of the same way that they're sort of talking about the subject. Well, I would frame that also in so that another way. I write a lot of journalism too, and you know, one of the the things you, I do a lot of opinion journalism. One of the things that you find when you do opinion journalism is that when you look at the statements that people in the media are saying, they're often lying, but they don't know they are. They're just not <laughs> informed properly. They haven't actually read the study that they're read, reading about. They read the like the summary of it, and when you read the study, you find that this truth, the truth, or the the results are much more complex. Let's say, right? So I think that's actually a great analogy back to poetry too which is to say that, you know, Bill O'Reilly may be, or whoever, let's say, and, and this happens on the left as well as on, right, on the right, right. <laughs> it's important to say, you know, may be sincere, but he is, or our, our imaginary figure is also lazy, right? Hasn't done the work to kind of figure out what is behind everything that's there. And it goes back to what Jericho was saying about the sense of being overwhelmed, mm -hmm. right? The stimuli coming from everywhere. And I think the way to bring that back to poetry is to say sincerity is very comforting because it, it identifies like a path. It's like, I can say this and it's true to my experience and therefore it's significant, right? And there's something very comforting about that. But I don't know if you've had this experience, but certainly there are moments in my poems where I do something like that, and then I look at it and I think, I haven't interrogated that moment enough, right? Like, there's not actually a deeper truth in that expression, right? I, my job now, as journalist or as poet, is to linger here and to think about the broader context for that sincerity. And maybe that's where irony enters in, or maybe my sincerity deepens and I find a, a more original, a stranger, a more precise, a more clear metaphor. You know, that, that would be one way of thinking about it. Oh, I just made, you just started to kind of answer this question oh. I had, which is, um, well, I wanted to say a couple of things. First is that I actually did write about 9-11, and the poems are not sentimental and are very sincere, and I can't find a publisher, because oh. I think there's nothing humorous about it, and it's a difficult subject, but it feels like it need, it still needs to be written about and talked about. Um, and so as a writer, I was much more interested in talking about irony and... Um, and knowing whether or not, as a writer, you are employing irony. In other words, do you actually sit down and say to yourself, Jericho, let's say, I'm going to write an ironic poem, and this is why. Um, and I was thinking about um, going back to what Megan had said about pop music, like there's two songs by Pink. One is she's sort of lamenting, please don't leave me. And then the other one, she's like, so what? I'm a rock star. <laughs> and I was just wondering, you know, uh, in your own writing or any of you, um, do you do you sort of make that decision consciously when you sit down? I'm going to write an ironic poem. Or how does that work for you guys? Great question. I, when, when I sit down, I just I try to make sentences that make me feel, I try to write sentences that make me feel good. And I don't pay attention to whether or not, like, I don't care when I sit down. I just, I'm so glad I get to sit down. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it's only, it's only in the revision process, which happens, I mean, for me, maybe a year later, because I, like, I'll put something in a file away and forget it, and then go back to it. I mean, I purposely forget it, and then go back to it. And, and then when I go back to it, I'm like, okay, now what can you make of this? That's when I'm, yeah. but that's, that's, that's such a different, I think that's such a that's a because that's that's a it's a decision that's not the same as the question you're asking, you know. Um, and I, I think this happens. I mean, Mark was talking about this when when Ted Hughes put that book together, right? Like, like that's what happens when you put a book together, and that's what happens when you that's what happens when you 
revise a poem, that you, you make those decisions then. But when you write a poem, you write sentences because you like the way, I mean, I think that's what poets do, right? They, I mean, I do anyway. I write things because I like, oh, that sounds good next to that, and that sounds good. This word, ooh, if I could put this word right after here, and it feels good while I'm doing it. And I don't know what any of that means while it's happening. I just push until I feel like I can't do it anymore. Well, I think it's very hard because I think that when we're talking about these subjects and these topics, I almost feel that they're the end result of what the reader perceives after the poem has been written. Because I think as, as every poet feels, when you're, when you're sitting down to write a poem, you're really you're trying to do you're trying to work against intention. I think intention is the is the poet's worst enemy. So if we sat down to write, say, a sincere poem or an erotic poem, I think it would fail from the very beginning because we're thinking about what the poem should be about and what the poem is before the poem even exists in and of itself. So I think that to even talk about irony, sincerity is maybe I think that's the perception after the poem has been completed, yeah. not before. Yeah, I'm, I'm just reminded of a, a, a quote by Stanley Kunitz when he was approached by a, 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 a another another a young poet who said, "I had a really great idea for a poem," and his response was, "That's too bad." <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Right. So, so true. So. So true. Um, but something, but you know, irony being in the ear or the eye or the experience of the beholder is a big, big, big deal, and also goes with this uninformed thing. Like, you know, I, I mean, I. For some reason, the erased de Kooning keeps coming back in my life, the Rauschenberg. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in reading about irony, somebody's like, oh, well, modern art's biggest practical joke. But if you hear Rauschenberg talk about it, I mean, it comes from this quest, you know, beyond quest to get, you know, the unmade into the made. And, you know, so, I mean, it's there's no irony in that at all. Zero. I mean, it's even shocking how sincere he was, but yet that's how it's going to be interpreted and what, you know, what gauge do we approach any poem with? And, you know, my sincerity could be your worst nightmare of irony, right? <laughs> right. Well, I am trying to figure out how to ask this question while I'm listening to what you said, but what Jericho and Tina just said really... Um, or is resonating for me. And when we're talking about, you know, these analogies of Fox News and um, The Daily Show and the way that irony and sincerity could be seen to be used in those formats, we're also talking about um, messages that are pre-formulated and that are being directed toward um, a potentially receptive or persuadable audience. And I don't think that's how we write poems necessarily. Um, when we're writing a poem, those tools of irony or sincerity are, are things that we're using with a lot of other things to try and gain a kind of trust. And I don't think it's necessarily for a reader, because I don't, think that, I don't believe we write thinking about the reader. So can you talk a little bit, what, what is the thing that you're trying, within yourself perhaps, that you're trying to embolden or make um, trust you in order to get out onto the page? Maybe you can talk about examples within your own work where um, irony or sincerity could have helped you get to the questions that you're really interested in, in examining, if that makes sense. Um, sure, I'll, I'll try to talk about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like in a way that's what we're talking around is that actual kind of quiet work that you're doing at your, at your desk. And, and it's why for me, you know, the poles of sincerity and irony don't really have that much application to what I'm actually doing when I'm writing because I don't not like anti-sincerity and pro-irony or vice versa. But um, in my, uh, th there's a poem in my first book once, which is called Peep Show, which is definitely an ironic, you know, the speaker is having an ironic experience of um, being in New York and always being watched. And she's having an ironic relationship to spectacle and to watching. So she's saying to sort of an imaginary person, someone is always watching, don't you think? That's not a sincere statement necessarily, right? There's a sort of irony embedded in that, which is that, in fact, there's this loneliness at the heart of her life, too, right? But I've been thinking about it a lot more in terms of um, sincerity recently, because I 
the poems that I first started out writing were much, much more ironic, and I've moved a little bit away from the more explicitly ironic poems. But in my second book, a lot of the subject matter deals with the death of my actual mother and was poems that were written out of a sense of necessity, not out of a sense of now I'm going to write a book about my mother, right? It was, these were the poems I was writing. And at some point, I started to think, OK, are these poems going to go into a book or not? And what might that mean? And, and also, how does one write about something like loss in ways that aren't um, pretending that you're not feeling the things you're feeling, but also aren't what we might call sentimental? You know, What is that line? Where does it stand? And for me, it comes back to you know, music and rhetoric and figure and, you know, metaphor being a form of figure, irony being a form of figure, that, you know, that irony is part of your experience of loss. That, so, so I wasn't really thinking about sincerity or irony until afterward and had to kind of look at the poems and think, how do these register? Is there enough torque? Is there enough complexity in them if, if it's not just me lamenting this person in a kind of private lament? What makes it more than, than that? And that's where I think all of the other reading and thinking and feeling and encounters, the kind of b- billiard ball encounters you have with the world, come in and have to be part of that, that rendering. I don't know if that answers your question, Tracy. Answer or, 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 well, just a real short question. The, the best-selling poet in America today for the last 15 years is Rumi, a 14th century Persian mystic. Does this say anything about a hunger that readers of poetry are not, is, that's not being fulfilled by people who are writing today so much? Do they just buy it or do they buy it and then read it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Great place to end. Unfortunately, we do have to get the room ready for the next oh, thing. Um, I'm sorry. Question. But oh. hopefully, we can talk about it. Before.